Hola, soy Alejandro Sauquillo y estoy aquí con CTD Connecting the Dots para que triunfes. How much Tesla will grow? 10x? No. 100x? 10,000x? Unlimited? Really? That is one sentence from our guest channel that it comes from a friend of him, the CTO of a unicorn AI company. But first of all, I want to welcome you, connecting the dot that you're like the Satoshi Nakamoto of the Tesla community, that nobody knows who you are. So welcome to my show. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having I, me. I'm very glad to be here. Uh, I, me too. It's it's a pleasure because especially I think the Spanish community that maybe they don't know you as well, mm, you make such a good content. But I wanted to start this mm, informal chat by asking you, um, who are you? Because in your videos you explain about a little bit about your background. And for me, it's impressive. I think that you don't say um, that much and you have a super high level technical background that I want you to explain it to us just shortly. Um, I'll tell my background for a moment, uh, what I can say, and then I'll answer the question of who I am. Um, my background, I studied aerospace engineering um, basically, I majored in uh, structures and manufacturing, but then I moved to, uh, when I started working, they needed an aer aerodynamics engineer, so I started working in aer aerodynamics. Uh, afterwards, I saw that I wrote lots of software, I really liked it, and I said, you it's when we started so, uh, aerospace, so we started with Fortran, and Fortran is really a very old language, it's not very user-friendly, so I just started learning other languages and I just moved to software. I became a software engineer. And lately, in the last um, 10 years or so, I'm in systems engineering, which is like looking at systems from end to end and designing the system, basically. Now, um, my I learned from M an MBA during the time. I headed several uh, groups and programs and projects and so on. But basically what I do is engineering. And you asked who I am. Now that's a very um, interesting question because I thought about it this myself in the past when I talk to pe uh, people and they say, oh, you see someone on TV and they say, who are you? And he says, um, I'm, a, I'm a teacher, or I'm an engineer, a, or I'm a football player. It always sounded to me very um, one-dimensional. Even said that people define themselves by their job, by their job type, uh, title. Like if I'm an engineer, or I'm an, a manager and so on, that's who I am. Not I'm a husband, family member, and so on and so on. Um, but lately, there was a, this switch. I think it's mail, mainly happened during this time that I'm with this Tesla and Elon and all that, all that, that suddenly I realized that if you ask me who I am, I'll say I'm an engineer. And that's not because of what I work. Even if I became a YouTuber right now, even if I stopped working in engineering and only did YouTube and so on, I would still say I'm an engineer because if you ask who I am, that's, uh, let's say, the core of myself. I think like an engineer, I always ask questions. I try to see what's um, things that interest me are how things work and so on. So um, it's not that I'm an engineer because that's what I work at, but I work at it because that's who I am. Um, I hope it didn't come out so strange. No, 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 it didn't come out strange. And as you say, we are not one dimension. And I can see by the way you you say who you are, that you also are a humble person. Because in one of your videos, you explain that you were working in a, 
really important defense project, I think, that it was published that you explained. And only I want to say the audience, especially the ones that have watched those videos, that you have been really nice that you sent me some documents that they... The I have been able to see that is true that your the things that you've said in that video and that you're explaining right now, but but now I wanted to move to um, the first sentence that I said at the beginning of the the interview about your city of friend. How would you define this city of super brilliant with one of the highest IQ of the earth? How would you explain this this person that she has been later explaining what is her view of the future of Tesla and Tesla's products? Uh, I don't really get the question. Did you ask how I see her view and vision of the future or how do I see her? How, how do you see her? How would you define her? Sorry that I didn't. Brilliant. Brilliant. She's really very sharp, very brilliant. And also a very, very nice person, very humble. Um, she's real nice. And about her technical background, you've explained over and over that she's an AI CTO of a unicorn yeah. tech green company that is based in Germany, but also in the United States. And um, how, how much do you think she knows about AI in comparison to, I don't know, to, to whatever uh, you can compare. I work, let's say I work with people who, I don't do AI myself, but uh, I did several projects which had lots of AI in them and people that are um, like work with me and so on are very, very good at AI and so on. And she's the sharpest one I know in that. Now, if you ask her, she'll say that she isn't the best AI person there is, but she has something that I have that, and she says that also Elon has and to a much greater degree, of course, which is she knows uh, which roads to go to, which means there are lots of options, lots of things to do. And you have this kind of engineering sense of where to go and where not to go, what to check and what not to check. So that's something that's really good at her. And she's also, if you ask something else, you ask, how do I describe her? Planned. She's the most planned person that I know. Um, she has uh, plans several years ahead, at least 10 years ahead. And she, I really don't want to talk a lot about her past and so on. I know, I, I know what I can talk about her and what not, but basically she had a very, she came from pretty, pretty bad background. And just in a few years, she transformed her entire life and so on. She got uh, friends, family, um, she shot uh, straight up with her job and so on, with her success. She's really bright and very, very planned. She actually met me through one of her plans. She needs someone to help her in something, so she's uh, kind of found me on the internet and um, like caught me on, on her hook and so on. Okay, I, I won't ask you much about her background. I hope that someday we will be able to unveil who she is and you also will unveil to the general public uh, who you are. But if you don't do it, it's it's great because you would be like Satoshi Nakamoto or you would be <laughs> like like Banksy, an artist, that there will always be this aura of these great thinking and creative people that the public doesn't know who they are. I am humble, uh, but I'm very far from their level. <laughs> No, you, you you have a super high. I, I was really impressed when when I knew what kind of projects you worked on. But going back to our company, Tesla, you are heavily invested. I'm also 
I'm also heavily invested. I want to do a disclaimer to all the people that say that we will be speaking about um, Tesla's forward-looking statements or things that we think or you think or your city of friends thinks. And this is not financial advice. And we are extremely biased because once you are you have invested, you are biased psychologically. Yes. But I wanted to ask you, like, I, I think that your videos about the city, your city of friend started with AI Day. And she said that it was the most underappreciated event of the century. Um, could, could you explain a little bit, like, what was your, um, what did she mean by that? And why was such an important event? And when I ask you about your city of friends, I also want your opinion. If you're not, if you don't agree with her, just tell me or yeah. I, I want to know like both opinions. There are two things I think that she said that are extremely important. She, she said something like, don't remember the exact quote, but it was something like, this is a day in a very underestimated event. And it will be remembered in history. One day when we look back in history, we'll just mark this day. And she saw two things there. The final result is that uh, Tesla will probably win the um, topic of um, AGI robots. And before that, a lot before that, factory robots. And probably AGI itself. So it's AG, uh, factory robots first, and then AGI and, and AGI robots. So that's the end result. And this will transform human, humanity once we have this. But the um, first set that, the, that she saw there was that the Tesla positions itself as a prime um, AI company and if until there it was pretty esoteric, it was just uh, the AI was mostly focused about FSD and a few other systems like their in-house operations and so on, their uh, OS and so on. But um, basically from that day on, they just positioned themselves as, she says it as a magnet. She says that AI has a huge problem, the world of AI has a huge problem of getting the right talent. And she said, there are lots of people doing AI and a lot of them are very, very good, but really a few are exceptional and really, really exceptional. And the way she says it, it's like, um, I'll give the example that she gave there in the video. It's basically, um, she said, let's say you want to get from uh, London to Paris or whatever, and you can take a driver and it can be a an okay driver, it can be a very good driver. Now, she says that it can be a taxi driver that knows all the way, all the shortcuts in the city and to how to go outside. But she said that these, uh, you can also get someone that can be like a Formula One driver who can take you, zoom all around, around the uh, roads and so on. But these exceptionals are people that won't, they won't even take these roads they just wait for you and wait for you with some VTOL aircraft, take you from where you are, zoom up and just fly straight ahead to that point to that point where you need them in Paris without even telling them and so on. So you just need to know, you say, I want to achieve this. And they find a way by themselves to do it much faster and better than other people can do. And these people are very few. For example, you can one that's very uh, prominent, of course, is Karpathy, Andrei Karpathy. So by her, these are very few, and it's very, very hard to get the right people. And, and I'll talk about her company in a moment, how they manage. But basically what she said is that Tesla just positioned themselves as a huge magnet in the middle of the field. And they, from now on, they'll just be able to recruit whoever they want. Of course, there are people who can't move there and so on and so on, but basically um, they are just the huge magnet for talent and that lots of people will apply, which we saw later on that the applications rose by 100x. And she said they'll just be able to get whoever they want. People will start talking about it 
we start discussing it and we start applying. And if someone doesn't apply and they want to cherry pick them, they'll just uh, send them a video of AI day and say, hey, we want you for this team. And that would be enough. And basically, I, I think this is what happened. Bas and later on, she told me this is exactly what's happening. And this magnet that Tesla created in AI Day, what do you think were the main points? Like this super talented AI talent, why do they want to go to Tesla after watching AI Day? It's because all the technology that they showed, it's because the ambition that they have, it's because the... Um, the colleagues that they're going to work, I mean, at least the the, the main executives that or the main heads that they were showing, Shashok, Karpathy, also, of course, Elon Musk. Well, what do you think is like the main reason why the AI talent now wants to work for Tesla after watching AI Day? Basically, what she says is and there are two things, of course. One of them is just working with the best technology there is. And you want to work at the cutting edge of things. And Tesla is that. You work at the cutting edge of um, AI. You um, basically understanding the world and turning vision into objects. Some of it is solved, but they are far ahead in the problems they are trying to solve. They are, as Elon said, it's solving a real world AI. So it's a huge. Um, huge uh, challenge if you look at it technically technologically but also the mission itself and the mission itself uh, tesla it's unbeatable really there aren't many companies that offer this thing and it's a huge thing um she by the way said that um when she said about um, she it all first started the first post that she wrote in her Facebook about AI Day was basically a rant. She ranted something like, uh, I'll say it, say it in my words, not how she said it, but something like, oh my God, I'm not going to get anyone now from my company because all the good guys <laughs> will leave me and I'll, I won't, I'll have a problem getting new guys. And basically she found a way around it later on, but according to her. But um, basically she said like the mission itself is huge. And if previously she could convince people to stay with her because of the mission, now it's impossible once Tesla is saying, we're going to make her bot that will make work a privilege, not a, not a necessity. And a huge thing. And I agree. I mean, if I was offered to work on, on that project, it would be probably the most in interesting project I could find in the most uh, important mission there is for humanity. Yeah. I just adjust, adjust the camera for a moment. And at least for what I understood from your videos, she was saying that Tesla in this recruitment of talent is looking for more for quality than quantity. And lately I was reading a book that I recommend all the Tesla community that is called Founders. I don't know like the continuation of the title, but it's Founders, like the history of PayPal, um, the whole history. And Jimmy Sonny, that I think I will have the pleasure to interview next week, he explains how in PayPal they were making uh, really small teams, but not only because um, a super talented person is more productive than a few non 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 that talented, like a few good um, engineers, but also because of the communication paths. Like if there's two people, there's one communication path. If there's five people, there's 10 communication paths. If there's 12 people, I think it's 66. So the communication path grow exponentially. So it means like once the teams grow, they get 
they get more, they get slower. So I remember about what she said. And, and I remember also like reading about the beginning of the Tesla Model S that Franz Van Holzhausen had four people in his team. And also the AI team. I think you've said in your videos that the autopilot, like the vision team is like 20 people. So it's really, really interesting that they're not looking for quantity and least in like the most cutting edge projects. Yes. Yes, uh, basically when uh, Volkswagen, when they said that uh, they are now going to make their new uh, operating, operating system for the ID models and so on, for the electric models, and they said we're, we are arranging a 5,000 people team for this. My feeling, I, I just tweeted a picture, a picture of spaghetti and so on. Because basically, what you get is spaghetti code. Yeah, I would be much more impressed if uh, instead Volkswagen would have said, "We are arranging this team, and we hired this guy who is very prominent to lead it." That would be much better than saying we got 5,000 people working on it, because basically a small team of very very good people can do a lot a lot more than 5,000 people working. Uh, 5,000, let's say, I won't even say average, let's say they are good, but not exceptional, then they'll do much less. Basically, uh -huh. uh, I, I think the best projects I worked at, the projects that had the largest success, including, including the one I sent you, were developed by very, very small teams. I mean, if it's a large project, it has lots of teams, but on every topic, there is a very small team working on it. And later on, if people like here, they say this small team developed it, they say, think it's even uh, irresponsible to do this, to do that. But that's the only way to progress fast and do the impossible. And um, Tesla right now in in their I, I'm not sure if they're developing, I guess they might be in Texas or in California, they're developing the, the Tesla bot. And I remember that I heard you speaking about how your CTO friend explained that the Tesla bots, once they are capable of doing some work, they won't even need human supervision because they will have the digital self-management that Joe Justice has explained in all his interviews. And this was mind-blowing to me because the system to to reward these Tesla bots is already there. So they just yes. need to make them efficient. Yes. And basically what's the interesting part is she said that also the technology for the bot itself is already there because if you look at things like stability and so on, these things are pretty, they are solved problems. You can, uh, I don't know if you know, but uh, there's these uh, things, I think Google did that, um, that uh, they took like a simulation and told the AI in the simulation, like let's play hide and seek and so on, where you can hide and where not. And they taught it the basic rules and so on, and get just gave run simulations and gave it scores. Or there was like, uh, you don't, you can't touch the floor and so on. And uh, they came to very, very innovative solutions that people didn't think about. And for example, I think there was one thing about you can't touch your the floor with your feet. So this one of the characters they are just turned on its back, so the feet were up, and it was okay. I and so on. And they came, they, so if you just tell, uh, run a simulation of a bot and tell it to, and the simulation itself, it's, it's not a simple simulation. It represents the physics and so on, the mechanics of the bot. And you tell it to walk, so on, or to get to a certain point. It will teach itself to walk. It will run a simulation, it will fail. It run another up simulation, it will get, get better and so on. So uh, within the runs, and it won't take a lot of time because running the simulation is cheap, and it won't take a lot of time. It will start walking. It will start doing its table, and maybe it will find even a better, more efficient way than humans can, according to its own physiology, to the whichever way you build the bot. So 
stability is solved, uh, how to walk is solved, and so on. The things that they need to do is basically find the actuators and so on to make the hands and so on. But, and also like, let's say in the past, there was the problem of how, if you take this uh, cup and so on, you want to hold the cup. So how do you hold it so you don't break it? Like you, do, you hold an egg and you don't crush it, but you can also hold a metal bar and you don't drop it and so on. All of these things are basically solved by the by running simulations and so on, and by running the letting the uh, bot experiment by itself, just let it hold things and see what happens. They give it these scores, so basically it's pretty easy. Uh, nothing is really easy, but it's it solved no really technical hurdles there. The main thing she said the the important thing is that she said something like, if you give me FSD, the current FSD software that cannot be released on the roads as uh, uh, as autonomous. So, but give me the FSD engine without any of the data. Then I can make a robot, uh, not me, her. I can make a robot and it'll be a good robot, but it won't be a good robot because I'm just such a genius. It's because if they solved it for me, the current FSG, uh, FSD sorry, can do everything that's needed for a factory robot, not an AGI robot that you can... Uh, uh, that can go and get, grab your groceries and so on, take care of your, take your dog for a walk. But uh, in a factory surrounding, you know what happens there. You see the, you know what to expect in a production line and so on. Things can be different. For example, if you have a, a bolt, you can have the bolt at a certain point, it can fall and be at another point and so on. But a bolt looks like a bolt. When you look at it, you see it's a bolt. And the same thing for a wire. Wire harnesses, until now, it was pretty much of a problem because each one, when it's dangling, it looks different. But for a bot, if you just run the simulations and let it see various wires, just first of all, feed it a few pictures of wires in different forms, it'll see the wires. And later on, when you'll see a real wire, it'll be easier for it to uh, distinguish it and see, okay, this is the wire. Now, in if you look at FSD for autonomous driving, the basic problem isn't seeing this is a dog, this is a cat, this is a car, and the car is going that way. It's that you have lots and lots of edge cases, which are different all the time, which you don't have in the factory because the factories, yeah. it looks the same. Basically, there are not a lot of edge cases. Also, in the... Uh, in FSD, if you have a mistake, if you uh, have uh, in one in a hundred thousand times, you make a mistake, you can kill someone. It's unacceptable. Ex unacceptable. In the factory, if you do, if you have a mistake, then the uh, uh, DSM, the digital self-management, will just take you. It didn't pass. Do it again. Solve it, and so on. So there won't be any problem. So it's much easier just to uh, solve it. So what she said is basically all the mechanics and the motion and so on of the bot, it's pretty easy to solve. The hard part is the recognition. And that part is already existing in current FSD, basically in current autopilot, not even FSD. So everything is there. Now, what this means basically is that she sees very soon, and basically uh, Elon later also said that, very soon she sees them putting a prototype in the factory, starting to learn one uh, stop after the other, one station after the other, and doing things. And what it will enable them, once they get confident in its abilities and so on, is basically to replace maybe all workers in the factory, or at least all uh, line workers in the factory with the bot, and these bots can work 24 seven. They don't need to uh, go home. They don't need to, they need some maintenance of course, but not a lot. And they'll know when they need the maintenance. Uh, so they'll be just replaced immediately by another bot. So they'll work 24 um, seven. Their work will be consistent all the time. And they'll probably, once they get the mechanic and so on, uh, efficient and so on, they'll do it faster than humans in two ways. One thing is, if you look, 
He said the basic problem with uh, factories right now, the assembly lines are working at and about the same speed as they did in Henry Ford's days. It's incredible. And this is because of the human factor. People now and people back then, they had the same stamina. They could work about the same. And let's say you, if I tell you how fast can you run, you can say, okay, for a hundred meter dash, I can run this fast. But later on, if I tell you, okay, now how, fa how fast can you run a marathon? Then A, maybe you don't have the stamina to run a marathon, but B, a, B, if you do, you can't do it at the same speed as you did that dash. You have to run much, much slower because it's much longer, longer distance. But the bot can run the marathon at about the same pace as it would do that dash. So it can just work much, much faster than humans. Now, of course, if you have a mixed environment, by the way, in the video you sent me, uh, the guy there same, said about the same, that if you have humans and bots working together, then the bot will have to work at the same pace as the human, because the human at the next stop, you don't want him to just get an overload of uh, stuff waiting for the humans to work on. But if you have the entire process automated with the bots, then what you have is what Elon defines as the alien dreadnought, which means you have an automated factory, which has all those regular factory bots, but it has the, uh, I mean, the mechanical old style bots that weld and so on. But you have also have lots and lots of uh, humanoid bots that replace humans as the task and they work much faster. So you have this uh, uh, Jacob press, the Jacob press just spits out the Jiga castings, and they go onto the pack, and you have the the bots, the humanoid bots, install the seats on them, and everything and everything works like at high speed. Yeah, just take the, the current factory, uh, factory and uh, a video of it, and re re uh, show it in high speed, sort of like they showed in the uh, in the movie from the Jiga Berlin, and so on, the um, sales movie. Um, yeah. So it just moves much, much faster. And when uh, someone at uh, the GigaFest in Berlin asked Elon, uh, how many factories do you think you'll need uh, the optimal case to ramp up to 20, 000, 20 million cars? And Elon said, I don't remember if it was four more factories or 10 more factories. And I thought that... I think 10 factories yeah. in total. Okay, probably 10. So I thought like basically that's uh, the uh, old school answer. The real answer would be no more factories because logistics aside, logistics, I mean, there are only that many uh, trains or cars and so on that you can bring with raw material and with uh, and and later on take the products, the cars out of the current factory. So you don't want to need to have bottlenecks uh, and so on. So logistics aside, each of the current factories can work like, let's say, 10 times faster, or let's be even, uh, let's be conservative, let's say four times faster, uh, faster. Then this means that Giga Berlin, after you complete the four stages, it won't be 2 million cars, it'll be 8 million cars. And take Texas also. Texas and Berlin alone, if you ramp with them four times, you already have more than 20 million cars. So... Yeah. Basically, once you have the humanoid bots working and they can work 24-7 at high speed, then uh, high speed, which means they can work at, even if they don't work faster than as fast as a human can do the job uh, for one time, one cycle, not the whole day. If you take a good worker and tell them, okay, now do this as fast as you can, even if the, the uh, bots can do it at that pace, but they can do it the entire day, it'll already ramp up the speed considerably. The main bottlenecks will be the, uh, the limiting factors won't be the work itself, but basically the supplies, the raw materials, the batteries and so on. So they will need to put bots in all the upstream and downstream um, supply chain. Yeah. And, 
Uh, I wanted to tell you a couple of things so about the video that I sent you that for the people that have watching, it's a video from Robert Scoble that he visit uh, giant.ai. It's a bot um, company um, much with a scope much smaller than, than Tesla. And there are two things that are really impressive. One that in his tweets that they got viral, but also in a text that he wrote afterwards, he said what you just said before, that the simulation that Tesla has is second to none. It's unbeatable. They give them a super fair advantage. And this uh, Robert Scoble, he's a tech blogger and he's in contact with so many tech people and he also I think worked in Microsoft and and, and everything and he has um, I don't know 200 300 thousand followers in Twitter so he's a, a person with um, uh, he, he's somebody that knows what he's talking about and the second thing is like watching this company that is a much simpler company, as you've said, that the CEO of Giant.ai, they said our scope is to make um, half robots, they don't even have legs, and they will go as fast as a person, but not faster. But the good thing is like, you can see that with these companies, they already have the dexterity to move things. So in the video that I will link in the description, uh, we can see like the, the robot picking things that before that was like something really hard to use their, their hands. So that is one thing that I think people don't realize that this um, dream of the alien dreadnought that you were speaking about of Elon Musk, but might might be closer because the robots before um, to move wires on to or to do torsions, as I think the CTO says in your videos, was much harder. But now is going to come and it's going to come faster than what the people think. And one question that I wanted to ask you, because you were comparing before the Tesla bot with the with the FSD driving that, OK, a car goes faster and it's much heavier. So it's much more dangerous than a bot. So if you had to bet your, I don't know, uh, any amount that you want, what would you bet that mm, there's going to be before one million FSD Tesla robot taxis or one million Tesla autonomous bots working before? Uh the FSD, FSD autonomous taxis, autonomous cars. I don't know if the taxis and so on, but the cars itself themselves, because basically, uh, let's say they solve the moment they solve uh, autonomous driving. It's really easy to have one million cars on the road because they're already there. They don't have to make them. They just have to be cars with the FSD or to have them uh, sign on to the FSD, either they bought it or they sign off onto the FSD program. But um, basically when it will happen, my guess was that basically not full autonomous, but as uh, what they said, the level two FSD, but the real FSD that can drive you on the road, the not the beta. My guess was this, at the end of this year, like Elon said, uh, basically it's, um, it's funny because about in 2016, I think, I started these uh, presentations about the future. And that's by the way what brought me to Tesla. And one of the things there I said there was, I, I made this kind of mean, a way to predict when things will happen, when disruptions will become, uh, uh, when their time will come. And one of the things I used was uh, like public opinion because I looked at previous disruptions and saw how I looked at, for example, at Google Trends and so on, and checked how, how often people thought, uh, talked about things and when they later appeared and so on. And what the opinion was of them, whether things were possible and when they really arrived. And of course, the main thing was that People are usually, they think linearly while the, um, while the reality is exponential. It's this X curve, okay? So my bet there was the, that I passed in these uh, presentations, I passed a survey about lots of things and asked the audience 
at this. Uh, it was pretty good the first time I did it. So it just uh, I started doing it again and again. It was uh, 28 or 30 times. So I passed along with the audience and things that uh, questionnaire for when do you think this will happen? Now, autonomous cars, they said that uh, it was like very far in the future. <laughs> Most people. There were people that said it will never arrive. Other people that said about uh, five years, ten, uh, sorry, it was 10 years, 20 years, and so on, 40 years. Uh, basically, the except for very few outliers, the um, the lowest scores were about 10 years from 2016. And my guess was five years. I said, uh, oh, it was 20, 15. My, my guess was five years, which means that at the end of 2020, I think, 2020, yeah. Um, I, yeah. At the end of 2020, it was supposed to be that you could go to the store, uh, to the car dealership or whatever, or nowadays online, and buy a car that will drive you in town, outside of town, and so on. Now, of course, I was wrong. And it was regardless of what Elon said. Elon said the same thing. He said it will be even sooner. But I was wrong. He was wrong. And why was that? Now, later on, I saw, showed in one of my deep videos that the guy that had NVIDIA's uh, um, car projects their uh, automobile uh, AI and so on, uh, also said the same thing. He said we were all too optimistic. Now, the difference is, of course, is that NVIDIA didn't, doesn't talk about it and uh, the car manufacturers don't talk about it while Elon did. And that's why everyone says Elon lied and uh, Elon uh, promised things and so on, and they didn't arrive. But he, the only difference is that Elon told everyone what you really thought. And what I thought and other people thought, and that is that the problem will be solved soon. Now, the why is this discrepancy? Why is this? Why didn't this happen? It's because uh, it goes both ways. It's the problem is not exponential. Like what I said is that people um, people expect things to be to go linearly. So they say if we have this progress. Then we continue the line and say we'll take 40 years and so on, but it always accelerates. So if I ask you when there will when will will there be a factory bot and so on, then this applies basically. But when you look at the cars, then it's not that same that same way because you don't have to look at this the exponent. You also have to look at the other side of the S curve. When it goes, when it flattens, it takes you a longer, when it takes you longer than you expect. So uh, when you say, okay, I want to get to one accident every 10 million miles, and you're currently at one accident every 1 million mile, and you look at the rate and you say, okay, we it should take this long, then no, it'll take much longer. Because there are more edge cases and the, the curve flattens now. So and this is why Elon was wrong. This is why I was wrong. Um, by the way, at the uh, end of 2020, when I lost that bet and I gave beers to the guys that I bet that it with, I said, OK, let's do a continuous bet. Another bet for half a year from now on, it'll take six months to get to FSD. We said, OK, it'll be, it won't have to be here where I live. It'll be just uh, Tesla cars and so on. But Tesla will offer FSD in six, uh, six months. They gl gladly took the bet and they won beers six months <laughs> later. And I'm not taking any more bets about that. But basically, it's just flattening. And so this takes time. But if Elon, Elon, Elon is aware of that, and he already got burnt in the past by overpromising because he said what he thought. So I think because he's aware of that, and now if he says it's the end of this year, I believe I believe that so. And if not, and then not much uh, forward. It will take a long time before the cars are fully autonomous and don't need humans in them. But for autonomous with a with a supervising driver, uh, end of this year. 
that part that you were explaining about the linear and exponential thinking, that reminds me of one, one story that I heard about Ray Kurzweil, that when they, will st when they started the G G genome sequencing project, I think in the 90s, the, the project was for 13 years. And when they were past half of it, uh, around the seventh year, they told Ray, look, we're never going to get it because we're just 1%. And he said, we're already 1%, then we're on track. So he, he realized that being 1% by half of the time, they were on time because they were at the beginning of the S curve that mm, it was beginning. And at the end, they managed to finish it. Okay, they finished it in 2001. There was like the 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 political exposition, but they will they finished it at 2003, but more or less they finished it when when they had to. But one thing that at this, it's blowing my mind lately about these exponential curves that has a lot to do with Tesla is AGI. AGI, when I read about it, it was like something crazy, impossible that will come, um, who knows, maybe in a few centuries or, or never. And that very few people said, okay, we will see it in our lifetime. But lately with all the improvements that we're watching with Dali Chu with Imachin with Gato from DeepMind. There's more and more AI experts that I'm hearing and reading that they're saying, okay, um, uh, now I'm not that sure that we won't see it in our lifetime. And, and I'm reading people that they said, okay, we will never have it. And they're saying, okay, maybe in 10 years we will have it. Lately, I think Dr. Know It Alls, I think he said in a few, few months ago, he's, he said something about, Mm, I think that mm, AI is arriving to a ceiling and we're going to have a, a, an AI winter. But lately he said, okay, I'm blown, blown away by these exponential mm, improvements. So exactly. I think in your videos you explain about the AGI bot that your city of French, he says, it won't be only mechanical, but it will be also like computer wise. This this capability will be able to supplant not only um, blue collar line workers, but also white collar engineers. So what, what, what do you think about this AGI bot or AGI inside Tesla's company? Uh, let's start by saying that first of all, uh, we already see things of that, uh, things like that happening right now. But we see them in specific topics. Not a, uh, AGI is artificial general intelligence. But if you do look at specific topics, you already see dedicated AI in specific topics. Like as you can see the doctors that instead of uh, having a doctor looking at uh, X-rays and seeing what's happening there, you already have these uh, AI looking at the pictures and realizing much better than uh, humans. Uh, where there is a lump and where there is a problem and so on, because they saw a lot more uh, larger databases of uh, x-rays and the they have the ability to look much uh, better to uh, the minute details of the picture and so on. So you see that uh, AGI can uh, right now help the humans, the human doctors find the problems, but later on it will replace them. You won't have people even uh, in the loop. You'll just have the X-ray passed through AI decoding, and they'll tell you, okay, you have a problem right there, and so on. And uh, you have this, of course, with the taxes and so on, that you see that uh, accountants and accountancy software, that's AI and so on. So you see it's replacing specific jobs. The AGI will be something that will be just general, and you can learn things by itself. I'm not talking right now about sentience, which may or may not arrive, but about the capability to learn things by itself, which means uh, this is actually uh, important because if you look at FSD, how does FSD learn? Let's say you have a car with FSD and the car sees uh, an alien, okay? 
the car doesn't know it's an alien. It doesn't. Uh, it can say whether it's a dog or a cat or a child and so on. It doesn't know that alien. It can. It can say it's a. Hob- it's an object. I don't want to hit it. Um, but it won't know where that is an alien. What to do? Uh, the learning is performed by taking the data from other cars, and you have this certain central learning, which you later later on disseminate to all the uh, cars, right? So my car and your car will actually have the same capabilities and be the same. Now, when you have the AGI bots, then let's say my AGI bot and your AGI bot will have have the same uh, basic capabilities and basic um, neural network and so on. But the data will be very different because um, let's say I want my bot to go and play uh, play with me or whatever, do the groceries for me. And um, you want your bot to do other stuff. So uh, we'll teach it different things. And it will know, my bot will know my family members, your bot will know yours and so on. So the capability of learning here is not the just the central capability. But it's just like you and I, as humans, we learned as children without knowing each other and so on. We didn't share things. Now, right now we are sharing and we are growing through it. But we, until now, we grew from things we did ourselves. So the bots will have the basic capability of learning themselves from their own experience. There will be this shared database and there will be also this unique database that's for every bot for, it, uh, for itself. And this is fascinating because the, this never happened till, till now. It, it's going to be mind blowing. But co- coming back to FSD, there's one thing that I haven't heard that much spoken in the Tesla community that it bothers me a little bit, that it gives me a, a doubt. And it is about Tesla's approach because I don't believe like mm, more narrow technical approaches as, such as LiDAR or, or or cameras with radar, they have mm, better possibility to have a general solution. But w- there, there's, a, there's a podcast lately from Lex Friedman and Demis Hassavis from DeepMind that he explains how they moved from imitation learning that was with AlphaGo, then they went from to Alpha Zero to Zero, and to AlphaMu. And Al- AlphaMu, what it made is just it learned by itself and it learned the rule by itself. So he says, like artificial intelligence is moving from teaching and give it a lot of inputs in the middle to just give it data and reinforce it. And I've seen, I think it's Coma AI, and also there's one startup in London that is Wave, that they're doing this approach. They're just telling the car just when they're doing correctly or incorrectly. So give it just input and and reinforcing the learning. And I don't know if as fast as as AI is growing, maybe in a few years, these companies, they have a chance to overpass Tesla. So I don't know if you have thought about it or what is your yeah, opinion? I have uh, basically, um, it depends on what you're, what you're trying to do. Uh, let's take, uh, let's talk about two topics. The first is autonomous driving and later on we'll talk about general AGI, okay? about AGI. Now, basically, if you what we feel you're trying to do is, um, let's talk about driving, okay, self-driving, then Elon said that LiDAR is a crutch, right? And which means, uh, like a crutch, it can help you walk if you find it hard working. But if you have this crutch wheel with you, it will be very hard for you to run later on if you have to carry it with you. So by that analogy, I say, I'll talk, I say why I'm talking about LiDAR in a moment. Let's just continue about LiDAR. Um, 
LIDAR, it complicates your data set. It puts uh, lots of input that either is redundant because you know it from the vision. Now, if you see a car in front of you, you know there's a car there. If you see a dog in front of you, you know there's a dog there when you can see it. Now, I'm not talking now about situations where there's when people do, can't drive. I talk about situations when humans can drive, okay? Because let's define the problem. We don't want to jump ahead of ourselves and go look. We can, like, we can sol try to solve uh, infinity. But uh, if we want to save lives and so on, we want to narrow the problem as much as possible. And right, right now, we want to save lives by having a car that can drive when humans can do. We try to solve when humans can, can, can't later on. So by having this crutch, it just complicates your data set. It, uh, as I said, it's either redundant, redundant because you know there's a car there through vision, or what's worse, it gave, gives you some also false signals, false input, which means you see some, you see something even there, but LiDAR tells you there is, and so on. And this uh, getting the your data set dirty is a huge problem in in uh, learning, in training artificial intelligence, and this. Um, makes solving the problem very, uh, it uh, delays it. Okay, uh, I can give you lots of examples, but let's just move on. Um, so you don't want this crutch. Now, why did I say, talk about this crutch? Because labeling, the different main difference between uh, Tesla and Coma AI, besides the number of sensors and so on, because Coma AI only uses their uh, one, um, one camera, one from camera and so on. And uh, mobile, I also, uh, as far as I know, know, they don't use many cameras and so on, but I'm, I'm, I don't know about the mobile like that. Basically, uh, if you look at, um, Coma AI, the main difference is that Coma AI doesn't do labeling and, uh, Tesla does. Labeling for those who don't know, it's when you, uh, when you see a, is, First of all, it was a still image, but later on it's a video, and you see a car, car there, or a child, or a dog, or a cat. And then a human, first of all, says, okay, this here is a cat, this here is a dog, this is your car. And what this is, it's a crutch, because later on uh, the AI learns, okay, this is a car, this is a dog, this is a cat, and it knows that it should behave in certain ways according to the season, things it sees. Otherwise, if you don't do this, you just show it the picture and it has to start understanding, okay, this year is, these icons go, uh, these uh, pixels go together and these pixels go together. And when these pixels go this way, then I should behave this way. And it takes much longer to understand instead of uh, learning that, okay, I should treat these pixels as one item, which is, uh, and this item is a cat. I'll have to learn how cats look like and so on, and how they behave and treat them accordingly. Because a cat usually, uh, it waits at the side of the road. And when you're, it looks, looks, look, and when your car is, is very near, then it just jumps across the road. So every creature acts, uh, acts this uh, differently. So basically it's a crutch because you tell it, okay, you can't start labeling, label everything. It takes lots of manual labor and uh, you don't have this kind of labor to uh, label the entire world. And things look differently because even a person, they can, they can uh, wear uh, different clothes, clothing and different colors. Uh, it can be a dress or uh, pants and so on. Um, the same person. So labeling is difficult, but what Tesla did, it started with labeling and then it moved to auto labeling. And recently we know that they, when when they said that they're uh, going to uh, do layoffs, the first thing I said that it's, it will be interesting to see how many labelers will be layoffed. And I heard that 200 people, I think, were uh, labelers, which is very encouraging because the it means that auto-labeling is growing 
And the autolabeling can grow uh, much faster than humans can. And this is their approach. So I'm not really afraid that they won't be able to keep up because they already automated it. Uh, by the way, my friend, it's a quote, my friend, she said that they're, that Tesla's auto, auto labeling is a quote to die for because uh, it's really impressive. So basically it's, um, they are already ahead of the, in this, I don't think it'll stop them or hold them down because they already know how to label things. And um, they don't really need all these labels because labeling, it solves things for you. And when you see similar things, you can already do the auto labeling or the uh, car itself, or you recognize them by what it already has in the training set. When it sees new things later on, and when it, we talk about AGI, then the new things are important because it has to learn them. Then it will learn to, um, I don't know, know if it will exactly label them, but it will certainly learn them. You learn, okay, these things I don't know. It's like a child. When you show a child a cat or a dog that they know, or the cats and dogs, they know them. But when they, you show them something new, they first of all, they look at it and they don't know what's happening and how to treat it. But once they, they pay special attention to it and they learn it, and next time they'll know what to do. Oh, um, by the way, I'm not an AI expert, as I said, I'm just, I worked with me. AI, I worked with the AI uh, in AI projects and so on. I know where to focus and where to look, but, and what to expect from my AI, but I'm sure I learned AI, but I'm, I didn't, never worked at it. I didn't, never developed myself. Me, me neither, uh, CDT. As we are approaching the end of the interview, I wanted to ask, to you, not to your CTO friends, to connecting the dots. How much do you think Tesla will be worth in 20 years time? 10X, 100X, 1000X, unlimited? 10 years time. 1000X is uh, very conservative. Wow. I'm serious. Uh, I, I, I said 20 years time, but you said 1,000x for 10 years, right? Uh, wow. Yeah, one, one thing is, basically, if, if we say uh, it would be much more than today's entire global economy, because if it produces uh, worker bots, they and they produce them economically and uh, smart bots that can do the tasks very fast and very efficiently, they will place humans everywhere. And they will do much more than humans can. And as we already saw that uh, when the when things become cheap, then the need for inexpensive, then the need for them, the uh, demand for them grows. And it grows also exponentially. So as the price of work goes down and things become very inexpensive, then the demand for products and for services and so on will rocket. It'll be much more than we can today. Uh, I think this goes together with something that, um, one of the things that people say right now is about the bots, they will replace people at work. So what happens when you and I, we can't go to our job? I mean, it'll take several jobs and several stages because first we'll see that drivers like uh, cab drivers, Uber, Uber drivers and uh, truck drivers and so on will be replaced. And you'll see accountants and uh, ex except in very specific topics and so on, they'll be replaced. And as I said, also in medicine and so on, lots of things will be replaced. And ultimately, when you reach AGI and so on, and factory workers, of course, they will be replaced. But ultimately, it'll be a stage where everyone will be replaced. Now, how will we work? What will we get? Now, Elon says uh, that there will be uh, UBI, universal basic income, which means everyone will get something from the government uh, to live upon. And my theory is, that there will be very uh, several stages because 
there will be, first of all, lots of uh, even revolutions and so on, because it won't be very uh, smooth, especially not if you look uh, globally. There will be people that will be laid off and will with no job and so on, and they won't be able to earn anything. Because if you look at their capabilities, everything they want to do, uh, bot or, or software or software running on a computer will do it better and cheaper. So you'll have to provide for them because right now, if you look at people, you say, okay, in capitalism, I believe in capitalism, then you say everyone should go and find a work, uh, something to work at. And you don't want to give people money to live on because they'll just go and become lazy and say, okay, I don't need to work. Why work when I can get money for free? And if you do give them, you give them just the basics so they will be encouraged to go and work. But what happens if even the very talented people, and these people are A, talented, B, motivated, they want to work, but there's nothing they can do. Everything they want to do is a bot can do better, a bot or software and so on. So what happens then? You'll have to find something that to that will take care of people. Now, there are several ideas about how this will happen. One of them is like in the Hunger Games, which says, okay, we won't provide them for them. We just have two classes, one of them the ruling class, and one of them the uh, unwashed masses and so on that will be in camps and so on. And we'll just give it the basic provision to live upon. Um, I don't think this will, will happen. It could happen for a while. We see some of it happening right now when, when you see very, very rich billionaires and so on. And I don't mean Elon. I mean people that, for example, uh, inherited their billions and don't do anything productive, just party and so on. And um, on the other side, you see people that were born uh, in, like normal people or poor and so on, and they can't get to these re level of riches ever. And some of them are kept in poverty. So we see some of it right now. But when you get to the entire society like that, it'll be there will be revolutions and so on. So during this hunger game, I don't think it will happen because uh, it's too inefficient. Let's say you're part of the ruling class, okay? Like you have 1 billion, 10 billion, 100 billion of today's dollars, okay? And you can live your life with a private army and you spend lots of money on this army, which will be this middle level between the billionaires and the uh, unwashed masses and so on, the poor masses. Uh, I, I don't I say I'm washed because it's uh, uh, an idiom and so on, but it's, you know, not their fault. Um, basically, you look at the masses, the poor masses, and maybe everyone, you know, everyone who isn't a billionaire or a policeman and so on, or an army, and you, this army will have to defend you from these attacks, and you won't be able to go anywhere you want, only in safe places and so on. Now, from a certain point, if you have 100 billion or uh, 200 billion, it doesn't really matter to your life. Or let's say, okay, let's say it does. If you have 10 trillion or 20 trillion, it won't change your life. But if you have freedom to go anywhere you want, it will change your life. And the way this freedom will arrive is if money will be distributed to people. What they say UBI, but it won't be basic income, income it will be generous income. I say UGI, universal generous income. And mm -hmm. the way I see it is not like people like uh, Elizabeth Warren, which I really despise, uh, says <laughs> and so on. Because what she says is like, Elon is rich, let's take his money and so on. We are not there right now. Because right now what happens is if Elon didn't, didn't have enough money, if, if they took some of his money, when he exited from PayPal, then right now we wouldn't have a Tesla and SpaceX because he put everything he had on these projects and so on, on these companies. And right now money is limited. But once you have this AGI and so on, then the growth of the economy will be much faster than the growth of population, which means, um, I already gave this example, but let's say it uh, again. Let's say we have 10 people 
And each of them, let's say, is perfect. Some communism and so on, but let's say they're socialists, they agree in it. Let's say each of them has uh, one, uh, one million dollars for 10 people. Now, if uh, one of the, these people wants to have 10 children, and you still have this socialist norm and so on, the other says, no, we, will, we don't want to have half a million for each of us because you want to bring 10 more people to this society, right? So the growth of population dilutes what everyone has. And people don't want to give to other people, of course, because they'll have less. But once the economy grows much faster than you can count, if right now we have 1 million, but next year we'll have 10 million, and the next year after that, 100 million, and so on. I'm just throwing numbers, it'll be slower, of course. But then even if I bring 10 children and so on, it won't really do anything for us, right? So even if this once economy uh, reaches some kind of tipping point and uh, it lifts off and zooms away through this AGI and so on, then shortly after that will be that uh, these companies that reach this point, it will be very, um, I'd say it'll be very stupid and stupid. It won't be not smart. It'll be very stupid for the people heading these uh, companies to just keep the money for themselves. And if if they want to, there will be laws like sort of like Elizabeth Warren wants to do right now, but these laws will be at a stage where it doesn't hurt them because no matter how fast you take from them, the growth will be higher. And at this point, will will be that people won't have to work because you'll have much more than you ever dreamt of. You can do whatever you want, and this will bring us to, and then there will be another stage, which will be a money-less society, money-free society. Because if I have a trillion dollars right now, and you have a trillion dollars, what does it matter? We can have everything we want. Everything is free, for example. And if it's not free, you'll just ask for a bot to make it and so on, or for bots to make it, and just everything will be very, very free. So at that stage, it will be just um, money-free society. There's this example in, um, and it's something that was in also in my uh, presentation, like from 2016 or 2018, later on, on a series of presentations, that in the one episode of Star Trek, the TV series Star Trek, yeah, yes. They found some kind of um, a spaceship floating along, and they caught it and found there was this uh, person there, a man that was uh, frozen, cryogenics, before he before he was about to die. He had cancer or something. He was about to die, so he, he was a very rich guy. So he freezed himself, and uh, what he hoped would happen happened. They found him. Their technology was very advanced, so they unfroze him. They scanned him. They saw the uh, this cancer. They cured it. And then he opens his eyes. Uh, he's healthy and so on. He asks them, what year is it? And they tell him what year. It's very far in the future, of course. And he says, oh, wow, I'm rich. I put everything I, did, I had on the, let's say, the S&P or whatever industry there is. And I'm rich. I have lots of money. And they look at him and say, what's money? Yeah. Because they have everything they need. But they don't have money because what's the point? I mean, money. money is, if I need something from you, I pay you for it. But if I can get it for for a cent or something, then I don't need to, to even deliver, send you the, uh, the money or you to even to look if you got it or something. Because we both have everything we need. Everything is cheap. And if you look, things are getting much, much cheaper. If you get into your car now and put, even if in today's prices of gas, how much is gas in uh, Spain right now? Uh, More a liter than of two gas. euros. More than two euros. 2.1, I think, or. Uh, okay, let's say about, about two euros, okay? So to take two euros, which isn't a lot, okay? Even poor people usually have two euros and put them in your car and drive uh, you'll got to get about 10, 13 kilometers away, something like that in, uh, let's say, a gas car, not an EV. 
and later on just walk away back home or sorry ask people to carry you on your on their back or something to carry you to carry you back home you'll have to pay these people a lot of money to carry you back home and it won't be as comfortable as, as it was as as quick as it was to just get into your car and drive away now in the past kings had people or horses and so on take them this distance and now we don't even think of it to just what well, just these two euros take us to these uh, 10 13 kilometers so much faster basically yeah. we are much richer than people ever imagined the uh we are now uh, talking with uh, webcams okay. just a few years ago they cost a lot of money right now they're not they don't don't cost a lot you can get them for very cheap yeah uh, you can go on AliExpress, aliexpress and buy um, a cell phone okay sorry smartphone for 50 bucks or whatever for very very cheap an android smartphone that will do things that just uh, 10 15 years ago were unimaginable or just you, know, you can just get it for very very cheap and prices will go and decline they'll go very, very much lower and uh, so ultimately what will happen there is that we want be, everything will become much much cheaper and the um, we won't be able to work so we'll have to get money from the government the government will take it from these corporations not from our uh, income tax because we won't be able to pay income tax we won't be working so these corporations that uh, employ these bots and so on this this will be the real capitalists because what they have is the, the means of production so the capitalists holding the means of production they will pay taxes but they won't even notice this tax if they ta pay let's say nowadays a company tax if you take ireland and so on which has a low company tax lower than most countries so it's some kind of a tax haven and so on and lots of companies go there so let's take their taxes i think it's more than 10 percent but if you take 10 percent of the profits of these companies later on when they employ these robots and so on just 10 percent tax or 5% tax, it will be more than enough to give all of society a lot richer life than we can imagine right now. We will all be millionaires. And that's, by the way, you asked about what I think about Tesla. I think Tesla, uh, this of course, a uh, call option, uh, as you said in the beginning, not financial advice, and we are both investors and biased and so on. But my friend, by the way, she uh, described it as a call op option on infinity. Because if Tesla, I, I like it. Yeah, if Tesla zooms up, and as I said before, they are already at the point that they can put an operating uh, worker bot prototype in the factory. And I think like it will be much sooner than we can believe that they will start changing people, replacing people on the factory line with bots. And they won't be saying the bots first, they just employ them instead of people. And they will start ramping the factory faster and faster, start shooting out cars. So Tesla without selling any bots, first of all, it will be much more productive and uh, much more um, profitable, of course. And they will start using bots for the mining companies and so on that they work with to get more throughput and more raw materials and so on. And SpaceX will use them and on Mars mission and so on. So basically these these are the Tesla, the Elon companies, the Elonians I call them, they will grow very, very fast. And from their own production, not yet from selling the bots. And then they will start selling the bots. And if these bots are capable and they don't have a problem like producing these bots because they are very, very efficient they showed it, they're the best at producing than any other company right now. So they're start producing them at scale. And if even if you're a Toyota or whatever, okay? Toyota, the car company, you will find it, uh, let's 
move the EV issue aside for a moment, uh, that they are going hydrogen, so on, the other foolish stuff. But um, uh, just one anecdote. You know what Toyota's real problem is with moving to EVs? What is and it? People don't know it. Uh, it's not just they're saying all the time that we want to spend just like BMW, we want to split it between the batteries and ice and the EVs and go gradually and so on. They're stalling. The real problem, people don't know it, is talent. Now, there's lots of talent in Japan and there's not of, lots of talent in the uh, battery industry and so on. And uh, they could do basically they could do. Um, EVs, but China is not far away, and they poached the talent from Japan. They offer them huge I salaries, VIP conditions, and the best talent. Uh, it takes us back to what my friend said about AI. Same thing. The best talent in uh, in battery tech and EVs and so on that the Japanese can get. They are poached by the Chinese to the Chinese industry. Mm -hmm. So people know it. So to, if you look at Toyota, they aren't as exciting as Tesla with emission and so on. But if you look at the and say, okay, I just want to make cars and so on. So people can go to work at Tesla. But if they would, don't go to work at Tesla and they have a choice of working in Toyota or some Japanese company and some sorry Chinese company Chinese that startup, is yeah. fully EV right now, and they treat these guys as uh, superstars and so on. Give them huge salaries, and they give them the freedom to develop the technology they want, just like Tesla does. Then it's a no-brainer, and people just leave and work in China. So it's a huge problem for uh, Toyota, and they can get talent, but really not enough. It takes them a lot of time to move forward. And this is why, by the way, they uh, plan to use BYD tech in the near future for some of their cars. But uh, this um, took me uh, aside for a moment. Where were we? Uh, we were in 10 years from now in a world of ab yeah. abundance and yeah. all of okay. us being billionaires. So, yeah. okay, even I, Toyota, even Toyota, let's say it wants to make ice cars or EVs or whatever it wants to make. If it employs, uh, if Toyota employs humans while Mazda or whatever employs bots and the bots can operate 24 seven faster than humans uh, and uh, they, do, they don't have cheap leave, they, uh, sorry, they don't have sick leave, they don't have to, they don't need catering they don't uh, need to go undressed and so on. You can charge them on the job on the fly and so on. And um, their job, their output is consistent quality all the time and so on. Then if Toyota employs humans while Mazda uh, employs uh, bots, it will be very short time before Mazda uh, passes Toyota. So basically every company that wants to stay competitive, not only in cars, in other industries as well, We'll have to employ these bots instead of humans. So there will be a huge shift, and there will be many companies in this field. Well, like example, the one that you showed uh, so uh, showed me in that video from Scoble, that um, they will have their bots doing that job and these jobs and so on. Um, but Tesla will be faster. Because first of all, their production capacity will be much faster than anyone else. And their technology uh, seems way ahead, first of all, in perception and also in uh, simulation, like Scoble himself said. And so there must, they can ramp up much faster. And when they reach AGI later on, all they, they need to do is to um, download the AGI suite onto the existing robots and all the existing robots will be AGI capable if you want them to. For example, if you still need them at the same job in the production line, you want to do it, you want to pay for it. But um, if you want um, the workers to be AGI, you can also download that. And the way I see it, they won't 
uh, sell the bots. They will rent them mm-hmm. for salary. Just like humans get salaries, these bots will get salaries. This is an assumption, of course. So I just want to drink from it because my throat is dry. One moment. So basically, every month they will get salaries for the as many bots as they can produce, by the way, because the demand will be faster than the ramp up. And they'll have um, automated production lines throwing away, just spitting out bots. And if you ask me when this will happen, you ask 20, year, 20 years from now, this will happen much, much sooner. The, because if they have factory bots on their own factories next year, at limited scale, then 10 years from now, they'll be, of course, selling them at high scale. So 20 years from now, even without AGI, and they will solve AGI before that, others too. But they, just if you look at factories alone, the entire world, 20 years from now, uh, even if you look at the cheapest sweatshops in the uh, um, in the backwards countries and so on, they won't be uh, price competitive with just employing these bots. So everywhere you just impl- uh, use the bots and you you will pay the same small salary of that sweatshop to Tesla for its bots. Yeah, or even less. Connecting oh, yeah. the dots, CTV. I think that with this optimistic future of bots working for everybody and giving abundance, we can end this conversation that I have enjoyed it really much. I I wanted to do it shorter, but I was really enjoying every reflection that you, you were doing. But I wanted to tell you that I have a tradition in my channel that every time that I have a guest, he or she at least 100% of the interviews has been he. I will need to have maybe your CTO in the future. I will not to have a, a woman, but uh, he has to answer with one word every concept that I tell him. Okay, so it's the one word game. So okay. Mr. CTD, are you ready for the one word concept that we're going to play? Should. What is the first concept, word, that comes to your mind when I tell you your CTO friend. Brilliant. Tesla bot. Uh, so, sorry, and the second word? Generous. Perfect. I don't mean about and money, but okay, shoot. Perfect. Yeah. Brilliant and generous. You cannot repeat, you cannot repeat these words, okay? Uh, um, Tesla bot. The future. Chinese EVs. Chinese EVs, the next OEMs. Basic, basically, people always talk about GM and Ford and BMW and so on, but 10 years from now, it'll just be Tesla and the Chinese EVs and very small OEMs. Yeah, OEMs. Tesla AGI bot. The future squared. <laughs> Ford. Ford Motor Company. Nice try. I hope they, I'm rooting for them. I hope they'll succeed. Cybertruck. I want it. (laughs) Me too. Digital self-management. Smart. Elon Musk. Love Love of humanity. GM? His love of his love towards humanity, I think. Yeah, yeah. GM? I don't want to curse. <laughs> but, uh, we will put a P. Um, okay, fucking liars. <laughs> um, P- uh, so, sorry uh, for, for one yes. moment about that. And you probably saw the GM series yeah, the of video, my yes, account, yes. account. So on the, basically, I was a GM fan when I was younger, before I moved to EVs and Tesla and so on, I was a GM fan and I like the GM cars and so on. And it's not really uh, very common in Europe or in Israel and so on. Um, 
but I was rooting for them. I was a fan. And some kind, some time ago, I w- wanted this first movie, this first uh, video of the series, to be just from some article I saw that by Edward Niedermeyer about GM transferring its tech to China. To China, yes, I yeah. saw it. And I said, okay, but it's Edward Niedermeyer, and I know he got a lot of things wrong about uh, about Tesla. So before I want to go and smear GM with things and so on, I wanted to go down to the rabbit hole and check myself whether that's true or not. And the more things I uncovered, it was, I couldn't believe it. Now, what, what I mean is, the first video talks about transferring the technology to China. There are two their Chinese partners, which are Sayak and uh, Wuling. It ended, the series ended when I say, okay, that was basically a smart move. Because no matter what, the Chinese would have gotten that technology. Of course, they did it first before the other companies gave technology, but the Chinese would have, would have gotten that anyway. And nowadays with the EVs, it doesn't even matter. But the second video I did was when I realized that they wanted to, basically, they saw Jim stopped being a producer. It became some kind of uh, way to take subsidies from countries all over the world. They have these factories, let's say in uh, Australia or Germany or whatever, and they say, want, say to the government, you want to keep us employing people here, so give us subsidies, because the plant cannot plant itself, support itself, it's not profitable and so on. So they get subsidies. But what happens is if that plant is profitable, for example, which was in, there was a time that Opel was very profitable, and even Holden in Australia, they're profitable. They use transfer pricing to take all the profits out to back to the headquarters to America. They don't, they enter and invest, they don't invest in new models, they don't invest in the factories, so the factories remain backwards. And that way, they always just need more and more subsidies from the government. And once the comp- the government stops giving the money, they just pull out. And the way I see it, I say it's not fair, because basically what happens is it's either you're capitalist or you're not capitalist. If you're capitalist, don't take subsidies and don't take that bailout with the $50 billion they took uh, in the past. Because uh, in capitalism, you fail, you die, your problem. But if you do take subsidies and you do take the bailout and so on, then you have to repay that to these pet taxpayers whose money was taken and given to you. You have to repay with loyalty, which means even if that plant isn't currently very profitable, you should invest in that plant to make it profitable and to produce in, in that country instead of moving, moving production to China. So my second video showed that their plan was basically to take the uh, profits. Uh, sorry, do you want, have to leave now or can I just continue for a moment? No, in maximum five minutes, Okay, but so, I still have. Okay, I did quickly. Their plan was just to basically move all production to China, especially EVs. They didn't make any EV factories in the States until recently because they plan to make the Lyric and all other cars in China and export them from China to America. And then they had one big problem, which was that Trump uh, put these uh, tariffs tariffs against imports from China. And they opposed them and so on and tried to stop them. But the tariffs remained. So after these tariffs, they started building this factory to zero and now started producing the Lyric and so on in the United States also, and this was something. But but the second video shows their plan was to start producing in China only. And the third video shows that they're still taking uh, subsidies and so on, Mm -hmm. and they're breading their, and all these subsidies go basically to their pockets as dividends. By the way, GM's largest private shareholders are Mary Barra. She's the largest, and I think that Lord Lloyd Royce or uh, her uh, VP, uh, I think uh, he's the second one, but I'm not, I'm not sure. But she's, she's James' 
largest shareholder after sharing I didn't Sanger. know that. And I didn't know that look, the CEO was also the largest. Yeah, and that's after selling a lot. She always sells yes. stocks, and uh, she sells stocks, and uh, but still she's the largest. And that's why they always try to pump the stock higher because they sell stock all the time. And uh, if you look at 2021, that's in my third video, 2021, you look at U.S. subsidies, only in the U.S. Let's remove the rest of the world. Tesla made in 2021 uh, almost a million cars, right? They got yes. zero, zero in U.S. subsidies, zero. Now, Toyota of America, they made, if I'm not mistaken, almost, and they 1.8 million cars in 2021, Toyota of America, and they got 1.8 billion, uh, 1.8, sorry, million, 1.8 million dollars in subsidies. It's not a lot. 1.8 million dollars in subsidies for um, ah, 1.8 million cars. Maybe I'm missing, yeah, 1.8 million cars. Uh, Okay. 1.8 million dollars. They, they got subsidies. Yeah. yeah. And uh, GM, which, if you look at their cars made in America, they only made, they sold in America just over two million cars, but some of them are made out of America. And they also export a bit to Canada and so on. So let's say the cars that they sold are these cars they made. So they put 2.2 million uh, million cars. It's not a lot more than Toyota. They got one hundred and seventy million dollars in subsidies, twenty twenty one. And if you look at twenty twenty and twenty nineteen together, that's in, in these two years, they got over one together. They got over one billion dollars in subsidies, and that's nowadays nobody's talking about it. And this year they just got from uh, Michigan itself, the state. I don't remember if it's one billion dollars or four billion dollars in state subsidies from Michigan alone. So they are some kind of money pump. They take money from people all around and they convert it into dividends because the dividends they take are higher than these subsidies. And they don't invest in development because it's much cheaper for them to have the, um, the, old the uh, joint venture in China with mm -hmm. SEAC do the development because basically it's split there because with uh, SEAC and with Wooling maybe. So they split the cost of development and it became a point where the company that they really loved and they did have some great engineering in the past. They had like, if you look at the Cadillac CTS a few years ago, it had the largest castings in the world. They're much smaller than the Giga castings, but they did know what to do. They did do the right step. They were largest cap castings in the world were in GM cars. And if you look at the skateboard, the battery skateboard that Tesla uses, and they now use with the Altium and other company, other uh, dedicated EV companies use, they invented it and they showed it in 2002. They showed the car with a, a show car with this skateboard and they said, we'll be able to make on this car and this platform, lots of bodies from a sports car to a truck and so on. They didn't, yeah. But then they killed it and they didn't do anything because it's much easier for them to just take money from the public and give it to the, yeah. uh, give it to the shareholders and so on. So I started it by C loving CTD. them. Unfortunately, now I have Sorry. to go, but Sorry. I really recommend the people to, to apart from follow you, to see this series of GM videos that are really, really interesting. And it's it's been a pleasure, apart from the Twitter that the people see in the screen, your Twitter and also your, your YouTube connecting the dots. W what is your Patreon that people can follow you on uh, support oh. you for all the great research that you make and great videos. Okay, thank you. Uh, my Twitter is connecting all dots, connecting O dots. Yeah, they, they uh, have it written. Yeah. So. My Patreon is the same, also connecting all dots. And um, basically my, um, from my Twitter, you can, uh, you say this, I put a tweet, a point link to my YouTube. So just use that link. Yeah. 
And uh, basically, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. I enjoy, really enjoyed it. Sorry for going on these tangents for a while. No, 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 no. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. Super interesting. I think I I hope next time I can uh, schedule like a bigger gap and we can speak without limit also without if you don't have anything to do and i wanted to ask you for a favor because apart from the game that finished with gm the one word game i have another tradition is like my guests say the sentence that i say in my videos at the beginning and at the end they say it themselves so i want you to say the sentence that i usually say that is hola soy connecting the dots y estoy aquí para que triunfes that it means hello i'm connecting the dots and i'm here you for for you to rock to to crush it to succeed so hola soy connecting the dots y estoy aquí para que triunfes hola soy conectando los puntos y estoy aquí para que triunfes oh, very good very good even Sorry with french accent, accent. Oh, hold on. You live in the best moment in history. Enjoy! If you like this video, please give it a like, leave a comment, share it with the whole universe. And since I want to make interesting videos for you, I need to know what interests you by your suggestions. If you have enjoyed this type of content, subscribe to this channel so you won't miss any future videos. I'm working hard to make the best possible content for you, but it takes time. Consider supporting me in Patreon, the best moment in history, so I can stop living under a bridge and continue creating content for you. There's a link in the description. Thank you very much from the heart. Gracias.